Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm genuinely delighted to have Charles Landon as my guest. He's a senior consultant at Intel. Charles, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. First, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of yours and your podcast, so it's really an honor to be here as a guest. Well, I'm flattered. I may struggle to get through the door later. (laughs) Not just because of the size of my buttocks, but the size of my head now as well. So, Charles, would you mind giving us 60 seconds on your background? Um, Because you've got a particularly interesting background. Sure. So, yeah, senior consultant. Well, a lot of large companies maintain internal consultants as as an alternative to the external consultancies that they often use. So... That kind of explains my title. My my main area of focus is user experience and product strategy. I also do coaching and I create and give workshops and trainings on a variety of topics from uh, product teamwork to even just focusing on coaching and consulting in general. I thought really that's what we'd start with is talking about my main focus, UX, and some interesting overlap I see between that and consulting in general. Could you define for the audience who may not be familiar with the term user experience in terms of what it actually means? Sure. So I'll share with the audience what it means to me. With any of these popular industry terms, different people seem to think they mean different things. To me, user experience is a field. And the main idea with the field is that whatever solution or service you're offering, whether it's a product you're building, a service you're providing, it behooves you to consider your actual product, the experience that results from interacting with it, right? So naturally, in most situations, you would want that experience to be pleasant, to be intuitive, to be helpful to not be frustrating or cumbersome, but it goes further than that because most of us are in business and being in business, our ultimate job is to create value for the business. And really there's only one way to do that. And that is to get some group of people to change their behavior in some way that creates value for the business. And this is where I'll share a a secret with your listeners. And when they hear this, they'll think, well, gee, duh, that's obvious. But it never ceases to amaze me that to product teams, this often, they act like this is a shocking revelation. When you build something, people don't use it the way you want them to just because (laughs) you want them to. (laughs) They engage in behavior for their own reasons. And so with UX, the main idea is that you're solving for this this overlap, that you're looking for something that will meet their needs. Now, this could be, it it could be users, customers, employees, constituents. It It really doesn't matter. Some people get pedantic about it and they want to distinguish between user experience and customer experience or service design versus product design. To me, that's sort of just a difference in scope and the underlying methods and focus and aim is, is fundamentally the same. So you're trying to solve a problem for them so that they engage in behavior that creates value for them that also creates bi-directional value for the business. And that bi-directional value is the really important piece to take out of that. That's right. So Again, from what you were describing, it sounds like it's really about reducing friction. But in my experience, sometimes creating points of friction can actually enhance and improve the user experience. So would you mind touching on that for a second? Well, in some situations it would. I would say it's fundamentally about reducing risk, that you're de-risking the current thinking. And that's where I start to see overlap with consulting and with Sandler in general that from a UX point of view, what you're ultimately doing is you're going into a situation where often people already think they know what should be done, and you're having to slow people down and say, look, what you think is the problem, the way you framed this, the narrative that you have running here that's based on some assumptions that probably haven't been surfaced and vetted, might not be the best problem to go after. 
So the guy that coined the term user experience, that's one of his main things that he teaches is that often what is presented to you as the problem is not the most value adding thing to go after. And I believe Sandler said the same thing. So, Absolutely. The problem they bring you is never the real problem. Yeah. And who is the fa- founder of UX then? Well, so the guy that coined the term, as I understand it, was named Don Norman. He wrote a very popular book called The Design of Everyday Things. And, ah, right. Okay. Yeah. I'll look that up. Another interesting point there is that you're looking for the reasons why people will use something the way you want them to. And often what teams resort to is asking people what they need. But the problem with that is that these reasons are often tacit reasons, which means people really don't know how to voice them. And what they know how to ask for frequently is not all that predictive of what they later do. So you can't just ask people what they need and then go build it because that often results in a lot of waste. So it's really more about discovery. And to me, that's kind of where UX and consulting in general overlap is that a lot of it boils down to discovery and your ability to do discovery and to tie decisions back to what's discovered. Very interesting because, uh, again, that builds on the problem they bring you is never the real problem. I interviewed a wonderfully interesting lady, Amy Brown, from a company called Authentics. And they found that with their call center monitoring process, so they they monitor about a billion calls a year in the US health system. And they were finding that up to 40% of those calls to the salespeople within the call center were actually technical support calls because people were getting stuck on the website. And because they didn't have any UX in that process, then, or that they really weren't engaging with the customers, they didn't realize this was the case. When they realized it, they then addressed those issues on the website and freed up 40% of sales resource, which had a dramatic effect uh, on on profitability, but also on customer satisfaction. Because I think the, another part of the same coin is customer satisfaction. uh, When it comes to the user experience, because if it's a frustration, then it's very easy to find yourself um, associating those negative feelings with the brand or with the purchase experience. So tell me this, if you're looking at product design, where does user experience come into the syntax of that? Well, Unfortunately, often it's brought in late and it's treated more as putting lipstick on a pig or putting a bow on your turd. And (laughs) teams often try or organizations often try to reduce it to prettying up something after it's gone wrong. When really, to me, the real medium of design is the decisions made and where design and user experience properly plays is more upstream where you're deciding what you should build in the first place, because that's what's going to have the largest impact on the resulting experience is the opportunity cost versus what you could have done instead. And that's really where it has the most impact is identifying what are the best levers to pull and exploring options and how people are framing the situation. Um, and, And sometimes what they assume was a good way to go about something really doesn't have the effect they intend. A good example, and it reminds me a little bit about what you were talking about, is um, there was an airport that was struggling with customer dissatisfaction around the wait time retrieving their luggage. And they spent millions of dollars trying to lean out that process of getting the luggage to the customer And they eventually, I believe, cut the wait time in half and found that customer satisfaction did not budge. (laughs) And what they ended up doing was kind of reframing the situation and realizing that it's not about how long they're having to wait so much as having to get there and wait in the first place. And instead of 
trying to uh, streamline the whole process, they moved the distance between the luggage terminal and the off ramp to where by the time that, that, you know, if you have to walk so far to get to your luggage that it's there by the time you get there, you don't perceive the weight. So that's adding friction. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. So from a practical standpoint, if I'm observing customer or user behavior, what are the different, uh, some of the different areas that we can look at in terms of their online, offline, physiological patterns of behavior that tell us that uh, there becomes a point of interest, a flag that tells us that we need to pay attention? Well, to me, it is less about what people ask for and more about watching them in their actual context and noticing what underlying issues might be that they might not even be focused on. And this doesn't just pertain to users, but also when you go into discovery with the teams you might be working with or with stakeholders or even as a consultant. And I think that that is a good, uh, another good overlap between user experience and consulting. So in Sandler, for example, they'll often say that when you go into discovery with the prospect, you're not there to educate the prospect. You're there to assess whether there's a fit. It's not a sales pitch, right? That going in and touting your work kind of already sets up a dynamic where you don't have equal business stature with the other person. And it might make you seem needy. If you read some of Jim Camp's stuff, he'll talk yeah. about the importance of wanting to avoid that. That if you come across as needy and trying to sell yourself, that just raises barriers on their behalf. Whereas really you're wanting to be seen as a peer going in and doing discovery. Well, discovery means you're doing most of the learning and you're not going to be doing most of the learning if you're doing as much talking as the other person. So that's one area where I think I see an interesting uh, dynamic there that often we say you're in conversation with a peer to assess whether there's a fit, but in a way that's misleading because it's really not a conversation. A conversation implies that you're sitting there with maybe with a friend and you, it's kind of an equitable exchange of information. They say some stuff, I say some stuff, they say some stuff, I say some stuff, and that's not how to go about it. It's really more a research interview. And you're not there to present yourself you're there to learn as much as you can. I Sometimes I like to say that you should be acting like a psychic. And I don't mean that in any way in terms of whether psychic ability actually exists. But that if you go to a psychic, what usually happens is the psychic doesn't say much of anything at all. They ask probing questions. They unpack what you say. They feed the words you use back to you. And they facilitate and prompt you to keep talking. And then they start feeding things back to you in ways that are maybe surprising to you, but you forget that it all came from you in the first place. And that's kind of what you're doing there. You're there to cold read the prospect. You're there to probe their thinking and add value to their thinking, whether they engage with you or not. And to me, that's very different than a conversation. Look at the kind of conversations that negotiators have doctors have, or general practitioners have with their patients, great salespeople have. What they do is they have the patient, the prospect, tell their story and to paint their own picture. And in doing that, and this is the really interesting stuff about the work that uh, Amy Brown is doing, that it comes from the unfiltered, spontaneous conversations, often that are initiated by the customer. And so they're giving their opinions about how they feel. They're telling you what their experience is, because I think it's very easy to exist in a bubble um, and believe your own rhetoric around, and your own propaganda, more like it, around what you think they should be experiencing. And through those biased filters, only taking out the information that corroborates your expectation or what you want them to uh, say and feel. And I think... What seems to be really key here 
is that you have to be strongly self-aware to do this well, because if you're not aware of your own feelings and your own filters, then there is a danger that you will get between the prospect and their decision to buy or the user and their ability to tell you what they need and want. And I think building on from that, you have to have a high level of empathy and you need to approach this with an open, receptive mind. And one of the things that really fascinates me, particularly now that we're seeing the explosion of AI, is just how much intrinsic bias is built in because of the early learning that the technology receives around what to expect and what to look for. You know, there was a, a really weird example a couple of years ago where hand dryers wouldn't recognize black skin. And as a result, they couldn't get uh, electric hand dryers to work, largely, presumably, because the engineers were white and they tested it on white subjects and it never crossed their mind that it wouldn't work otherwise. And I think uh, one of the things that I'm seeing the really sophisticated advanced thinkers in AI do is they have a diverse range of opinion and a diverse range of, so in Amy's case, she has a huge range of varied age, gender, uh, sexual orientation, ethnic background, uh, social scientists, looking at the data before they instruct the AI what to look for, so that they've uh, created an environment that allows the AI uh, to pick up all, uh, to, to provide the full picture, rather than just a biased, blinkered view. Yeah, that's a good example. In product work in general, there's uh, with the popularity of what's called agile, there's often this notion that you can just start building. And as you build, you can iteratively fix what arises as problems as you go on. But that's often not the case, because what usually happens instead is that as you proceed, you're spending degrees of freedom. And the more they're spent, the harder it is to go back and undo things. And so it it really is better to do some discovery and de-risking up front before those degrees of freedom are spent, before you're locked into options and you have baked in opportunity cost that that will be more expensive to then go back and undo. That's true in terms of the product you're building, but it's also in terms of who you engage with as a consultant or as a UX researcher. Uh, And it's also true in terms of strategy. If you do the planning without having done the thinking beforehand, often your strategy is massively flawed. So you need to sit down. Um, uh, Keith Cunningham has a lovely exercise, uh, which is on a daily basis, 45 minutes, you, a pen, and a pad of paper, and one question. And you work from that question, you think it through. I I was chatting to my pal, Phil McGowan, who's just got his PhD in selling, came through yesterday. So congratulations, Phil. And he has a, a pitch evaluation process that forces people to really think about whether or not their proposition has any legs. It kicks off with questions like, what's the need the company is fulfilling? What's the evidence that's there that this need is uh, deemed to be unmet by the potential customers? Has it been validated? Who are the competitors and what do their financials look like? What, how quickly could existing suppliers imitate the idea? Now, have you clearly been able to define the value proposition to the selling company over the competition, uh, to the buying company over comp- uh, competitors and so on? And if you haven't done that thinking before you launch a product, before you design a product, before you build a business, before you go to market, if you haven't done that planning and thinking before you go and meet a prospect, then chances are you will come with your own biases and filters. That will mean that you are between the prospect and their decision to buy or the user and them having a great experience. As you answer questions like that, you are making design decisions, whether you think of them in that way or not. And when you're working with an organization or a team, often they will have already answered a lot of those questions and not not explicitly. It's more baked into the prevailing narrative. It's more 
there's a story that they're telling themselves that's based on a set of assumptions that they haven't really explored. And that frames their thinking and sets a context of what information they see as relevant and what they see as not relevant. And from that point on, they'll start to emotionally tag information as being relevant or not relevant based on the prevailing frame. And that to me, that's the most impactful thing that UX can do is poke at the problem frame and explore the underlying assumptions and help create a mental space for viable alternative paths forward to value that may not have been considered. And this gets into cognitive bias too. You were talking about bias baked into AI. It's it's baked in there in the discovery conversation. If you go in there as a sales pitch, you already have a frame or narrative that you're trying to sell. And if they buy into that, they're anchored to it. And you're not really exploring. You're not really doing discovery. You're not going to hear their thoughts that they would have shared had you not gone in and anchored the conversation in that way. From a research point of view, that you've confounded the results. And really what you should be doing is more similar to what a strategist might call scenario planning, that their prevailing narrative and its assumed futures is based on assumptions that you instead want to explore. And to them, it seems compelling because they've fleshed it out in their minds as a narrative. It has connected the dots in their minds. And to break them out of that, you need to help flesh out alternative narratives that when it starts connecting the dots in other ways, frees them up to start switching points of view and switching frames. and that can open some space to where they won't necessarily discount information because it contradicts what was the prevailing narrative. There's a term I love. I'm not sure what what the source is on this, but that when you have a narrative that isn't questioned, you can consider that your ghost scenario. So it's kind of like you're you're haunted by your assumptions you haven't you haven't vetted. I think what you're also indicating there is that by going in with those biases and those limitations that you're creating an unnecessary constraint on the prospect's ability or willingness to buy. Um, And you're probably leaving money on the table. And therein, again, lies another problem. Because if you are going in as a seller or as a consultant and you've got an idea of what you're going to sell them up front, and that's what's uh, driving your questioning, what's driving your narrative, instead of you doing uh, genuine research and discovery, then the chances are that not only are you leaving money on the table, but you are doing them a disservice if you're capable of helping them in other ways, whether directly or through partners by bringing somebody else in and right. helping them solve the true problem. Well, yeah, not only that, you're leaving money on the table in two different important ways. First, in terms of whether it's a good fit or not. If it's not a good fit, you want to surface that up front. And to my way of thinking, I would think it's more important to say no to a bad fit than to say yes to a good fit. Because you want to avoid the opportunity cost. That's Andy Grove said that when you say yes to one option, you're saying no to the others. And if you haven't explored those other options and what the opportunity cost might be, then you might not be feeling the need to assess the fit. That's true from a consulting point of view. That's true in terms of what Sandler teaches. It's true from a UX point of view. Often when you're brought in as a UX researcher, sometimes the people bringing you in, if you don't research them, you might find yourself in a situation where they're not going to tie what you find back to their decisions and change their strategy based on what you learn. Sometimes they're more wanting you to call findings to support the decisions they've already made. It's kind of research theater. They're using you for marketing purposes, and that's probably something you want to say no to. But you're also leaving value on the table in terms of not improving their thinking, not helping them expose their own frame and create value adding options, whether or not they engage with you or not. Being in discovery with you should create value uh, for them, whether whether you engage with them or not. If you go in there and you're pitching and you're selling your ideas and your frame, you're you're 
probably coming off as needy, but you're also not helping improve the thinking at play. Um, you talk, um, going back to cognitive bias, an example that I really like, um, people talk a lot about confirmation bias and a lot of this was popularized by Kahneman's book, but a lot of this research goes back to the 60s and 50s even. There was a famous experiment, I think in the 60s by P.C. Wason. And he, showed, he would show people a series of numbers, like say I show you sequence of three numbers and it just says two, four, six. And I tell you that this series of numbers adheres to a secret rule. I know what the rule is and you don't. I want you to throw out other series of numbers to, and I'll tell you, does it conform to the rule or does it not? Well, what most people do, you know, if I say it's two, four, six, most people will be like eight, 10, 12. Yes. Six, eight, 10. Yes. And they'll do that and do that, do that. And then they'll say, okay, the rule is that uh, it's even numbers that increase by two. And the rule is actually it's in any sequence of, of ascending numbers. Right. But if you don't expand your frame, if you don't try to prove it wrong, the current thinking wrong, you won't you won't realize that you you can't think your way out of the box if you're just trying to prove it true. So, Charles, tell me, what are three questions that people should be asking about user experience, but they don't? Right. Well, so top of mind, I would say the most important question is how can we leverage user experience to de-risk our thinking and create value in ways that we are not using it, how can we leverage user experience experts to teach us to do this ourselves so that it's baked into our teams and organizations and not brought in as a headcount that's then handing off um, findings? And how, in, in light of that, kind of a similar or highly similar question is, how do we scale this capability or know-how? Often. Organizations right now are often way far more focused on teams taking requests from people and building what's requested as quickly as possible. And that's very different thinking than exploring what is requested and why and fleshing out alternatives and chunking up to what changes are these requests meant to achieve and what might be alternative ways to achieve it? From those three questions, it strikes me that the user experience folks need to be brought in right at the outset of any product design. And well, uh, I they, think so. And I, I suspect, I mean, I, for, for the last couple of years, I've been coming to the conclusion that the future CEO is likely no longer to come from the CFO or the VP of sales. I think where they're going to come from will be the head of channel, the head of data analytics, and the head of uh, CX or UX, because these are the people who've got the broadest view and the, uh, the, the widest range of understanding of the customer and the environment in which they exist. And that is increasingly important because if you're producing your products and your services in isolation from the customer, the chances are you will come up with... My pal Jerry Lemberg always used to describe entrepreneurs as people who produced elegant solutions to problems that don't exist. I see this so often with over-engineered software packed full of functionality that no one ever uses. And... Um, trying to develop uh, interfaces that engineers and you know, your target market's engineers and they don't want or need a user interface in the way that uh, a typical consumer will. Or you see people producing you know, Edsels in effect. If the market isn't ready for uh, what you're bringing, you're just going to spend an awful lot of time trying to educate at your cost. And then odds are you're going to be bankrupt by the time you know, your ideas uh, are uh, relevant. So yeah. why is it that there are not UX people typically on the board of companies? Well, hopefully that will start to change more. I think that some of it has to do with wanting decisions. You know, there's, there's this, 
a lot of it boils down to decision authority and how it's distributed and the politics around who gets to what make who gets to make what decisions and that is really where you want to poke if you want to do the most de-risking and improve your strategic thinking the most you know even in terms of pure ux i mean if you're talking about the experience you're providing to your users and your customers what you build and why has a far greater impact on the resulting experience than the shade of blue of a button on the flipping page. But also in terms of strategy and the opportunity cost of not exploring the decision quality of the prevailing narrative, that's something user experience, as I've been saying throughout our conversation, that's something that user experience can really help with. Um, it's similar to me. A lot of this is very similar to lateral thinking, the De Bono stuff that goes back to the 1960s. That he has a quote I love: "That you can't dig a hole in a deeper place by digging the same hole deeper." And <laughs> a lot of teams are focused on digging the hole as quickly as possible. UX is more about where the hole should have been dug. You're not, you're not going, if you, if you built the wrong thing, you're not going to fix that problem by iteratively tweaking what you're already building. Um, Can you give some concrete examples of where UX brought in at the right time has been able to eliminate or uh, significantly mitigate risk? The problem with that is that it gets into concepts like cost of delay and traditional cost accounting often scoffs at some of these arguments because if you do research and you don't build something that you think was clearly the wrong thing to do and you say, okay, there, there was an opportunity cost there, a traditional cost accounting would often come back and say, well, that have, that's not a real cost. Well, there are some really good examples on the flip side of that where uh, organizations have designed and built product where customers just didn't see them being appropriate in that category and they died slow and painful death and I, I remember interviewing Karen Mangia a couple of months ago and she cited an example where um, the customer experience person had gone out spoken to customers and they were absolutely explicit and categorical in their um, feedback which is we do not see you in this space we will never spend money with you in this category and the CEO puffed his chest up and said, well, they're wrong. I'm making a captain's call. And uh, off he went and continued to uh, with the product launch. And they ended up having to withdraw and it massively affected their revenues and uh, made them um, you know, potentially put them at risk because if you flop that big, then you become an acquisition target and it can be career ending. Now, obviously, there's always that quote from Henry Ford, which is, if I listen to customers, all I produce is a faster horse. Yeah, Steve Jobs, to some degree, produced product that no one was asking for, but he had that idea in his head. How do you find the balance? Because uh, you know, we wouldn't have had the smartphone, we wouldn't have had the iPod, uh, you know, stuff like that if there weren't those visionaries out there who were willing to go fly counter to what logic was to, and what you know, received wisdom was uh, suggesting. Yeah, so, well, in the product world, there's a, people often distinguish between output and outcome, and teams often focus on the output, the features they're creating, and because that's the easy thing to focus on. So one thing that it's important to do is to kind of chunk up to focus on the outcome. If you build a certain thing, what are you trying to achieve by building that? And what are some other ways to provide that benefit? If you're software enabling something, what are some alternative ways to getting at the underlying issue Instead of software enabling, if it's a cumbersome workflow, why not redesign the workflow itself? If it's uh, people are buying an expensive dashboard, um, 
because they want custom visual displays for a certain meeting, why not look at how the information is being presented in the meeting itself? I have a really powerful, concrete example of really understanding the value of being focused on outcome. I interviewed mm-hmm. Patty Hatter, who is the C- uh, Senior VP for Customer Experience for Palo Alto Networks. And she implemented a, an outcome-based pricing model for their professional services. So if you want outcome A, B, and C, you pay X dollars. If you want A, B, C, D, and F, you pay Y dollars. And if you want A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, uh, you pay Z dollars. Now, what was really interesting, they just released their numbers for uh, Q, their Q4 last week, and uh, they grew professional services revenue and 98% by making it outcome-based and serving the customer the way they really wanted to be served. Because they don't care. They just don't care about how much time or materials you put in. What they're interested in is the outcome. If you buy a pen, you're not buying it because you want a pen. You're buying it because you want to write stuff. And customers buy technology because they want outcomes. And I think one of the really important lessons to take from all of this is that the minute you start talking about or making it about your product, you are relegating the uh, the conversation to cost and uh, you are at best becoming an order taker. What you're not doing is becoming your customer's partner. And I think this is a trend that I'm starting to see glimmers of in the most forward-thinking companies out in the market, that they are all looking, what they're looking at is how do we become our customers' partners? And partners don't always agree. Partners fight. Partners help each other to get better through constructive conflict. And I I think one of the things that I'm taking from our conversation today is that to do UX well actually requires quite a lot of courage and also quite a lot of of, uh, constructive conflict. Would that be fair? Oh, of course. Yeah. You're often playing devil's advocate. You are often challenging team and organization thinking. You're often taking an unpopular view. You're often trying to change what would be the status quo going in and often having to do that while ramping up in an area you might not be all that familiar with. So how does being an outsider help? Well, ideally, I think that this UX expertise should be baked into the team itself. Being an outsider can help from not, you haven't been simmering in the existing assumptions. So sometimes an outside perspective is very helpful. And that allows you to come in and do research in a way that someone who has been advocating a certain position would probably find more challenging to do. David Epstein's book, Range, really focuses on the importance of having a breadth of experience. And in an area that, a specialist area that requires creativity, generalists will often massively outperform specialists because they can pull from different areas. I mean, I've worked in about 500 different segments of the market, and I've been able to draw from uh, my client who is a matchmaking business. So basically what they were doing was matching up uh, very well-educated Japanese women with extremely wealthy but time poor and lonely professional men. And actually we worked out that it was little more than being a headhunting business. What you were trying to do was create a right cultural fit. So it was about chemistry, shared values, shared outcomes. And uh, we took them from an average order value of £1,200 to £36,000 in three months. And we went from a three to six month sales cycle to two weeks. By being able to uh, join those dots, I was able to make that connection that they couldn't because they were too close to the problem. So again, how often do you find yourself in conversations around product development or managing risk 
where you are having to challenge uh, long-held, deeply be- uh, believed assumptions than finding yourself facing sort of the, the, uh, the old guard who are saying, well, that's not the way we do it in this company or that doesn't make commercial sense. And what, what, what have you done in order to power through that? Well, I think that there's a sense in which that's always the case in any engagement or working with any team because it's just human nature that often people will think they already know what the right thing to do is. And part of it is kind of poking at that first best guess and surfacing underlying assumptions. Being an outsider, you might be able to better see the frame than the people who have been swimming in it. But one of the most famous examples is probably Kodak that went bankrupt and ironically also invented the digital camera, but didn't yeah. see how it fit into their business model of selling film instead of thinking they were in the business of capturing memories or however else they could have they could have framed it. I've now got that Donald Draper moment. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you haven't seen Mad Men, there's a wonderful scene where uh, the main character, Don Draper, is doing a pitch and uh, they're selling the uh, Kodak carousel, and it's all about, you know, it tells this heart wrenching, tear jerking story about how they're capturing memories. They're not selling film and uh, incredibly powerful. Okay, so help me understand this transferring the whole process uh, or the thinking process of UX into a consulting context. What advice would you give to people who are? being brought in as external third parties to apply the principles of user experience in bettering uh, their consulting engagements? Sure. Well, I would focus probably most on the skill of conducting research interviews. And I wouldn't frame it as that you're necessarily doing research interviews, but that there are things that you can learn from that that would benefit you in your everyday consulting practice, becoming better at facilitating, becoming better at asking good, powerful questions that prompt unpacking without leading the prospect or whoever it is that you're talking to. I often get a lot of value just out of exposing someone's thinking and getting them to I'm I'm being more Socratic with with my approach. I'm not going in and acting like the expert and telling them what I think is the case and why. I am more getting them to share their expertise and reveal their thinking to me. And then when important metaphors come up, exploring those or asking what they mean by certain terms or if they throw out a term that even a term that we all nominally we would assume everyone, everyone knows what agile is. Often when you get people to share what it means to them. It's very different than what other people think about that. And in terms of product team, that's very valuable to do that um, right out of the gate to see to what extent they have a unified product vision, that they are on the same page in terms of what they're doing and why. Because often you'll find that that's not the case and it's best to flesh that out up front rather than having thrash later down the line. Absolutely. And again, I think another element to this is in looking at how businesses are run and led, because I think ambiguity at the top leads to politics at the bottom. And ambiguity is generally the mother of all fuck ups. If you want to ensure that people down the line are in conflict, making excuses, blaming then be ambiguous about what is expected. And I think one of the most important skills of leaders is constantly reiterating their purpose, reminding people of what the mission and purpose are, and doing so at every opportunity. Whether you, know, you have a daily meeting, remind people of why we are doing this and what we are trying to achieve so that everybody knows that is their job. One of the best examples of this was JCB, the digger company, and they wanted to take market share from Caterpillar. And they came up with this fabulous two-line mission, which is kill cat. 
And if you asked anyone <laughs> in the organization what their job was, kill cat. And so from the janitor to Sir Martin Bamford, uh, the chairman, everybody knew that their job was basically kill cat. Take market share from them. Whatever you can do, take market share from them. Because they were the number two in the category and their job was to take market share from number one. And if you have everybody rowing in the same direction at the same pace, then the boat runs smoothly. Now, again, this is a a huge challenge in businesses um, because if the founders or the leaders are unclear, then you get this nuance and these Chinese whispers. And when people leave a meeting, and I think this is another really important element of this, which is that when you leave a meeting, make sure that decisions have been made responsibility and accountability have been assigned and there are clear next steps uh, in terms of when things are going to happen and who does what by when to what standard and Mm -hmm. when they're going to report back. And in terms of product development, if that doesn't happen, what have you seen uh, go wrong? Well, it's... (laughs) So to me, one of the interesting things that comes up is when you start enforcing things like that and you find yourself kind of fudging answering those questions, then maybe a lot of the meetings that you're having don't actually need to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) That's kind of a bonus that, because that's often a, a constraint with a lot of teams is that people are just stuck in too many meetings in the first place. Tell me, what what are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment, Charles? Well, so uh, what I've been focusing on lately is helping others become more consultative and taking some of what I teach and do in terms of coaching and applying that to consulting. So in terms of getting better at doing discovery meetings, and I've been doing some learning and getting some mentoring in terms of state awareness, controlling your state, how to actually how to act in discovery meetings and how that impacts the outcome of the meeting. Not just, not what you say, but how you say it and what you're doing non-verbally and why and paying more attention to your own non-verbals. That's something I've really been focusing a lot on. I noticed a blog that you wrote uh, called Increasing Options with Tita Totters. I'll put a link to this because it's a really fascinating uh, read. Do you mind just um, giving us a two-minute overview of the core messages there? And one thing that really caught my attention was blips. So blip is a concept from Michael Grender, who's one of my mentors. Michael Grender is John Grender's brother, the co-founder of NLP. Yep. And one of his concepts, so he, he is a, Michael Grinder is a nonverbal behavior expert, but what he focuses it on is not looking at the other person and trying to infer things based on watching their nonverbals, but becoming more aware of your own nonverbals and using that awareness to improve your performance. Um, so he talks a lot about breathing and the importance of breathing and how if you are breathing high in the chest and taking shorter, more rapid breaths, you're getting less oxygen to the brain. You are probably more perhaps in fight or flight or more likely to be hooked, maybe even on the drama triangle, which is another thing that we could have talked about. Whereas if you are being conscious of your breathing and you're breathing lower, you're using all of your lungs, you will be calmer. You will probably be speaking slowly, you'll be processing information in a different way. He teaches that you should, if you have your stance, if you hold one arm kind of parallel to the ground like this, and you have one arm rest or one hand resting on your upper belly, you want to make sure that that hand is moving. and You are doing a slower belly breathing. So the concept of BLIP uh, is an acronym. It stands for breathing level indicates permission. And what he means is if you're talking to someone and they're obviously worked up, or Sandler would say that they are, they seem more emotional than intellectual, they're going to be processing information differently. And that should indicate to you that you need to switch your approach. So as Michael Grender would put it, 
bonding and rapport are important, but rapport is not the same thing as permission. And you don't always have permission to influence someone the way that you might want to, either because they're an emotional, they're in an emotional state where they're not receptive to that influence. So first you would have to focus on kind of the elephant in the room and label emotions and change what they're feeling and change their breathing to more move them from maybe they're in, I like to think of it as a no room and a yes room. No matter what you say, they're going to say no to because they're in the no room and you can't reason them out of that room. You have to wait until they're in the yes room and they're in a different state. And then also just in terms of diplomatically, or I can't tell, in terms of diplomacy, you're not always the best person to do that influencing. So you might consider what emissary can you send? Who might be the, the right person to do the influencing that you would like to have happen? You might have history with this person, or they might have um, a very different role than yours, and it would be better heard from someone with a similar role to theirs. So, you know, your no matter how good your arguments are or how airtight your logic is, the, the bottom line is that facts don't influence beyond how they're emotionally tagged. So if they're going to discount whatever you're saying, then you need to find a way around that and find a way in where you have permission to influence. So the concept with blip, though, is that breathing can be an indication of whether you do have permission to influence. And then if they're calm and they're breathing low and they're focused more on facts and logic, then you probably do more have a, a way in and have higher permission. That's really fascinating. I'd love to talk about that more if, um, if we uh, get together again. Charles, tell me this. You, you have, and this isn't about regret, but you've got a golden ticket and you could whisper in the ear of the idiot Charles, age 23. What choice bit of advice would you give him? Right. So I would, um, I would tell the younger version of myself that first, you end up becoming like the people you spend your most time with. <laughs> and if you're not consciously <laughs> selecting that, if you're not making choices, in terms of what you'd like to have happen and what you would like to see happen in your life, then the larger question probably is that, or the larger issue probably is that you don't have a vision for your life or you don't have a plan. And you know, so there's that saying there that if you don't have a plan, you'll you'll end up being part of someone else's. Well, if you're hanging out with people and none of you have a plan, you're just kind of uh, floating aimlessly through life. So I would, I would tell younger Charles to make more conscious decisions and to plan his life instead of just floating. And spend it with people who you feel are going to bring value. And I think I, I read somewhere uh, a few years back that you earn the median of the 10 people that you spend the most time with. And uh, I think you also learn the median of the people that you spend the most time with. You know, if these are people who became functionally illiterate the minute they left school or university, then that's going to uh, rub off and you're going to spend an awful lot of your time filling your brain with drivel. Uh, certainly for me, one of the best lessons that I learned was be constantly look to learn and have that childlike learning curiosity. And learn from other people. I wish I'd learned to ask for help before my late 40s. Because I always felt that asking for help would be an imposition or it was a sign of weakness and nothing could be further from the truth. It takes great vulnerability and strength to ask for help. But the question people should be asking is who, not what or how. And uh, if, if you want to accelerate your career, if you want to get results, then the first question you should be asking is who knows the answer? And then go and ask them. This podcast has been a godsend, uh, an absolute blessing in that respect. Because if there's stuff that I'm interested in, I invite people onto the podcast. And for an hour, they teach me. <laughs> I, I cannot well, begin. I hope to... I taught you something. I, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Tell me this. How can people get hold of you? 
Well, there aren't very many people named Charles Lambden. So I'm on Twitter. It's at CG Lambden. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, if you type my name into Google, most of what comes up will be my blog that you mentioned is called Columbus's Egg. Why Columbus's Egg? Earlier, I mentioned that a lot of this goes back to lateral thinking and Edward de Bono, just finding different entries into a problem and exploring options and waiting bias. So the story with Columbus's egg, this is probably not a true story, but the story is that after Columbus did his famous voyage, he was sitting around with some friends one day and one of his friends said, you know, what you did really wasn't big deal because if you hadn't done that, then shortly thereafter, someone else is bound to have done it. So you were, you were kind of just lucky. And supposedly he asked for an egg and challenged the group, can you stand this egg on one end so that it doesn't fall over? And they took, the, they passed the egg around and no one could do it because, you know, the egg always falls over and totters and ends up on its side. And it got back to Columbus and he took the egg and slammed it down so that the tip was broken and it stayed standing up. And then the story, the story is that he said, the solution is obvious after you've seen it done. Yep. <laughs> Okay, wonderful title then. Excellent. Charles Landon, thank you so much. This has been incredibly interesting. And I sincerely hope that we can do this again. Anytime. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, then please like, comment and share and subscribe. And if you want to get in touch with me, then my email address is marcuskauke at me.com or marcus at laughs, L-A-U-G-H-S hyphen last, L-A-S-T dot com. That's marcus at laughs hyphen last dot com. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.